Let me just say before we start, if you're an easily spooked individual, this probably isn't the video for you. And also, if you're under the age of... I'm not gonna put some arbitrary age limit here, but if you're too young, you're too young. Please go watch something else. The video itself won't contain any jump scares, but the imagery might be a little bit frightening, and I will try to deliver information in the most, like, comfy way possible, but my way of presenting things can only affect what I'm actually talking about so much, so just, uh, I'm looking out for you. And also, staff of YouTube, there is no blood in this video whatsoever. Any and all red substances seen throughout are ketchup. Anyways, with those disclaimers out of the way, what I decided to do was compile six My Little Pony creepypastas that all correlate to one of the main six, and we'll be looking through them and see if there's any good ones or if they're all a load of... After all, a couple of these stories are like really well-known popular memes within the fandom, and I thought it was probably worth taking a look at them to see what kind of impacts it had on the fandom at large and stuff. So let us let this wheel decide upon the order of which stories to look at. Wow, how fitting. When people think My Little Pony Creepypasta, Cupcakes is probably the very first thing that comes to mind. Written by some guy named Drecker Jones under the moniker Sergeant Sprinkles, Cupcakes holds uh, quite the reputation online for being badly written. However, most people do give it credit for being one of, if not the first My Little Pony Creepypasta in existence. So let us see if there's anything redeeming about it or if it actually is as bad as everyone says. To summarize, the story involves Pinkie Pie inviting Rainbow Dash to make cupcakes. Pinkie then gives Dashie a cupcake with a scary substance hidden within that knocks her out. Once Dashie regains conciseness, she figures that she's tied up in a room decorated by organs and bones. Then she proceeds to get tortured. As the author details, The stench of her urine filled her mucus caked nostrils. As her vision swam into focus, she saw a very pouty Pinkie Pie removing a large adrenaline needle from her chest. Stomping her hooves, the frustrated Pinkie lashed out- What are you talking about? At least we get this hilarious monologue. Oh, don't go yet, Dash. She started pulling out the rest of the organs, stopping at each one. I know I can be a real pain, Creus, but you know I'm just kidney with you. You really got to learn to liver it up. Boy, these jokes are getting bladder. Guess you gotta develop a stomach for them. Just kidding, that would be hilarious, but that's actually from the proofread edit of the story. The original version accidentally says pain keys instead of pancreas. How do you mess up a unique pun that you made up in your own story? Also, what she says these jokes are getting bladder, is bladder a pun on bad? Better or batter because both work in the situation. I know batter isn't the word, but still you get the point. Anyways, Pinky ends up torturing Rainbow Dash by cutting off her wings and cutie mark and blah 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 until Rainbow Dash is reduced to Rainbow Ash. <coughs> Though nobody really talks about this, the original version of the story ends with it turning out that Apple Bloom is Pinky's accomplice, and they go set out to presumably do the same thing to Silver Spoon. I assume the rewrite version that everyone's more familiar with got rid of this scene since it, it really comes out of nowhere and it's not even necessary. Like, it's one thing to say that Pinky went crazy out at the side end one day and tortured Rainbow Dash, but it's a whole other layer of suspension of disbelief if you need me to subscribe to the idea that Apple Bloom is secretly Pinky's partner in crime and all of this. Alright, let's start off with the compliments. I'm happy this wasn't some spooky lost episode story. That would have been incredibly stupid. The second compliment is that there's a bunch of alternate endings by other writers, meaning that it inspired people, which is good. But then again, that's probably because the real ending sucked. Now for the not compliments. It was dumb. Then again, life is dumb, yet we give life a chance, so let's give this a chance. The criticism most have with this story is how it's like, the author clearly came up with the idea of gore first and wrote the whole story around that. Most of the story is just describing how Pinky was torturing Rainbow Dash and it gets stale incredibly quick. Though, even as a self-proclaimed genius, I'm not really sure how to fix that issue since that was basically the entire intention and point of the story. It could have been shorter, I guess. I think that would have made it a little bit more bearable. The author the author stated in a journal entry on DeviantArt that he didn't expect the story to go past the original post on 4chan, and that he isn't even sure what to think of its popularity. As of now, I have no clue if this guy's still even alive anymore, seeing that his last post on DeviantArt was in 2012, and I can't seem to find any other one of his social media pages. Anyways, since this guy isn't able to come up with what he thinks of his story's popularity, I'll just go ahead and do the thinking for him. Basically, I... Really appreciate Cupcakes existing. A secretly cannibalistic Pinkie Pie on a mission to go around doing fun things to every pony in Ponyville? That's a pretty cool concept, even if the execution of the story wasn't the best. 
The thing that's really weird about cupcakes is that if a random mom were to look up My Little Pony themed cupcake ideas for little Susie's 6th birthday party, she'll be treated to the likes of this. On a similar note, for some reason, if you look up Pinkie Pie's actual full name, Pink Amina Diane Pie, you'll just get a bunch of results for the cupcakes pinky. It's pretty weird since by itself, that name doesn't really have any creepy context to it. Or is there? There is, but we'll get to that later. Anyways, on top of that, because the season 1 episode Party of One decided to show Pinkie's depressive side, a lot of people who took to the task of drawing fan art of the creepy pasta did so with that version of Pinky, which is pretty clever. But all of that gets elevated when it seems as though the actual show made a reference back to cupcakes in the season 8 episode Yakety Sex with Rainbow Dash and a depressed Pinky baking cupcakes together, along with Rainbow Dash making Pinky do this creepy smile, which is something present in a bunch of cupcakes fan art. I mean, this can't be coincidence, right? What else is weird is how this fan vector of cupcakes Pinky wearing this costume made from other ponies' cutie marks and wings was put on this boot like bag for some reason. I wonder how many kids there are who've unknowingly acquired this bag and wore it to school like no big deal, which once again would have been weird. And that's pretty much the extent I'll go for the story, calling it nothing more than weird. If Cupcakes was forgotten in obscurity, I really wouldn't care about it as I'm sure there are no less than a couple hundred of forgotten My Little Pony fanfics of a similar or more extreme ilk that I have zero interest in spending my precious hours reading. But the fact that this one in particular just got popular enough for the show to maybe reference it, it is kind of cool. Before we move on to the next story, let us take a look at this really cool video by the channel Boom Goes Maximus, where this Giga Chad actually bakes cupcakes with meat in them to test whether or not Pinky would have been able to hide the texture of Rainbow Dash and cupcakes. Now, in order to test this properly, we're going to be making three kinds of cupcakes using three kinds of meat. Turkey, bacon, and beef. We're going to be making two of each, with one being plain and one having icing on top to see if that affects the taste at all. Alright, final verdict. The turkey did not change the taste, but you could definitely tell it was there by the texture. The bacon didn't really change the texture too much, but it definitely changed the taste. It could barely be hidden by the icing. The beef completely changed the texture and the taste, and the icing did nothing. What a mad lad. Perhaps it is worth revisiting this story again in the future to just do an extremely deep dive into every little fan-made alternate ending and sequel to Cupcakes, but for now, I think I've had enough of this grinny little thing. <laughs> Moving on. Alright, let's get this over with. Before I talk about the story itself, I just want to bring up the fact that this video in particular has been bugging me for years now since it says this. Number 2. The Rainbow Factory when you have a story so good it has a song tributed to it, you know it's a good one. No, it's the other way around. The creepypasta was based off the song. That's why every chapter in the story starts with a line or two from the song. Do your research. The same mistake is repeated by the creepypasta biographies wiki, which is something you can disprove with like two minutes of research. The song Rainbow Factory was made by Wooden Toaster because of a music competition where the prompt was to describe how rainbows are made in Equestria. The lyrics are actually really simple and nothing too splendid, especially with how repetitive it is. Also, it brings up this random thing called the Pegasus device without even elaborating on what it is, which I must say is a pretty big power move. Anyways, an individual who goes by Aurora Dawn must have felt some inspiration spark from this song because it resulted in this giant long story. So let's dig in and see if it's any good. The story starts off with a short blurb going off about how the method in which rainbows are created in Equestria has dark and mysterious origins and what we are about to read is an account of such a case of ponies finding out what truly goes on in the Rainbow Factory. We start off with a class of Pegasi taking a test to graduate flight school. Throughout their test, Scootaloo and her friend Orion Solstice murmur about how nobody really knows what happens to anyone who fails the test. The author then notes that cases of these Pegasi failing tests are uncommon and there's usually only one or two per class that do, which is stupid because there are only six students in the test. We know this because the students were called out in alphabetical order and Scootaloo mentioned that she's the very last one who took it. That means that one to two ponies failing every year leaves us with a conservative average success rate of only 83%. If we're going with the more liberal two failures per year, that's only a 66% success rate. That is jaw-droppingly low for what the author was most likely going for. Anyways, the first one up to bat for the test is the author 
author self-insert Aurora Dawn. This part is actually super stupid. Let's take a look at how the author describes himself. Well, the author's a guy, the EOC's a girl. Every pony watched as Aurora quickly reached the starting altitude and then began a direct and purposeful attack on the positioned clouds. With expert timing and intelligent angles, the sky was soon empty of any moisture. Scootaloo and Orion watched with open mouths as they watched the first testy pull fast and tight turns, expertly shooting dead center through each and every hoop. Finally, Aurora pulled herself up to the proper altitude, hovered and closed her wings. The group of students gasped as she started plummeting down towards the clouds and counted breathlessly. They sighed as they watched her wings open in the correct amount of time, collectively holding that relief. Notice how he used the word expertly not only once but twice in order to describe herself? and also went into great detail about how she's got some perfect moves, not egotistical at all. But you know, if she passes the test here, that means we won't get to see her for the rest of the story, so the author makes sure to suddenly give her a problem that makes her fail the test, despite the fact that she's a double expert and intelligent. 10 out of 10 writing. This results in Scootaloo and Orion sacrificing their chances of passing the test in order to bend over backwards to save her beloved author. Once again, I must emphasize 10 out of 10 writing. I must also emphasize how the story lets us know that Scootaloo looked at him through her purple eyes. As opposed to her green eyes? Scootaloo's eyes are purple, you don't have to like specify. If you're trying to emphasize the fact that she has purple eyes because it's thematic to the story or whatever, which it's not, just say, looked at him with her eyes that shone purple or, or something. The phrasing is just confusing here. I just find it odd how the grammar suddenly goes from being pretty good towards the beginning of the story to eventually making really obvious mistakes. Anyways, ponies from across Cloudsdale who just failed their test are brought to this scary place and they all get told that they are worthless since they can't fly. However, though they may be worthless, they're not useless since they'll be extracted in order to be used for the production of rainbows. It turns out that it was none other than Rainbow Dash who was the one running this whole operation. What follows is a bunch of failed Pegasi children becoming not sentient from rainbow factory workers doing their thing. It's kind of funny how literally none of the deaths really had any impact for me whatsoever since they're all OCs and there hasn't been enough character exploration for me to actually care. And the only thing keeping me from reading the story besides the completion of this video was to see what'll happen to Scootaloo, but it just ends with a cliffhanger with the implication that Rainbow Dash is about to end Scootaloo's life. What a conclusion, though I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Before I get to all the criticism I have, I'll start with the positives. For one, I really like the almost steampunk-ish grimy factory setting, especially paired up with the cover art image on the official Fim Fiction upload. It's really cool and I think that even if the character exploration wasn't the best or whatever in the story, the world building sure as heck was. Which is actually something that's making me on teetering on wanting to get around to reading the sequels eventually. Anyways, how come when Pinkie Pie is a cold-blooded killer going around doing what she does, it's actually disgusting and creepy and gross, but when Rainbow Dash does the exact same thing, it doesn't make her scarier, it makes her hotter. If anyone has any theories as to why this is, please let me know because I couldn't sleep for days searching for an answer, only to be left with the thought that I'm going to die alone. Speaking of dying, I was honestly just waiting for Aurora Dawn to die already, as in the character in the story, not the author. If there was a twist at the very end where it turns out that the whole story was actually the character Aurora Dawn's first hoof account, that would have actually been really cool and would have been a great excuse as to why there's not much to the story beyond dialogue that the characters exchange and all the content context of the Rainbow Factory itself being told through dialogue rather than being told in an omnipresent format like the average novel. Also, Aurora going off about how she's a perfect flyer could have been seen as an embellishment of this character looking back at her childhood while telling the story to us. But with the way that it sits currently, this might as well be one of the most indifferent things I've ever read. Like I said, there are four official follow-ups to Rainbow Factory, and the author Aurora Dawn continues to be active on social media to this day, meaning unlike Cupcakes, the author is still alive and well. I guess the most well-known fan-made thing that came from Rainbow Factory are all the remixes of the song, plus the music video by the creatively named Brony Dance Party, but like, those are all fan-made material for the original song by Wooden Toaster, not the fanfic, so I guess that doesn't really count. I think the most notable fan works of this would really just be fan art of it. Also, there's some Ask Tumblr blogs involving this fanfic's universe versions of the characters. I'm no Tumblr user by any means, but I think it's a pretty big dang shame that so many of these pages have been deleted from history for one reason or another and are lost to time. It doesn't matter if these were the greatest works of literature in existence or if it was the edgiest piece of cringe in existence or anything in between. It's all a shame the same, just for the sole purpose of preserving memories and what could have been used to give insight and context to times of old. Similarly to Cupcakes, the show actually seemed to have referenced Rainbow Factory as well in the show. Just take a listen to the background music in this scene. And compare it to this.
Like, the melody is vaguely similar, and I think it's in the same key. I mean, it's definitely, like, similar instruments. But once again, like the cupcakes, quote-unquote, reference, it could just be coincidence. But the fact that this deals with something super specific, like Rainbow Dash and the Weather Factory, it's at least worth noting. But as for the legacy of the Rainbow Factory, that's pretty much the long and short of it. There have been some attempts to make a full-length Rainbow Factory movie, as evident from this Tumblr post from just last year. Unfortunately, a while ago, this photo had been leaked by a person who attended the test screening of the teaser trailer for the Rainbow Factory movie. Our only consolation, as we made clear in the screening, this belongs to scrapped and unfinished scenes from the film, so at least the current designs were not leaked. I have to admit they look good, considering it took us only a week to finish a trailer and it's mostly recycled footage. I don't know, what do y'all think? I have no idea what test screening they're even talking about, and if this is an actual leak or if the people behind it just posted it to build up hype or what. Either way, at least it's some sort of proof that there's something that's being made by somebody out there. Then I found this 30 second teaser trailer of this movie that the post was talking about. Let me play it for you real quick. Yep, that's right, we're 10 seconds into the teaser, meaning that one third of this was literally just the opening logo. Let me play the rest and you tell me what you think. Wow, if that doesn't get you excited for it, I don't know what will. There was also this other attempt that got a cease and desist by Hasbro, which, if that's true, that sucks. I was using pretty much the only clip that exists of this movie in the background, and as you can see, this animation is pretty clean, and clearly there's been a lot of effort put into it. In fact, apparently it was being worked on from 2013 to 2017, so it really is a shame that it couldn't see the light of day. Whatever. If the wheel lands on Applejack, you guys all owe me $10,000 each. Oh wow, what a coincidence. Written by Magpie Pony, I think an Apple sleep experiment is like the only Applejack creepypasta, or at least the most well-known one. Anyways, being a newer creepypasta, as in 2017, there's not much background to go over. It seemed to have just been posted on film fiction and got popular due to the lost narrator narrating it. So there's a heat wave and Applejack needs to work extra or else she'll lose her farm since Filthy Rich wants more money. But to make matters worse, Big Mac gets hospitalized from a heat stroke. So Applejack goes to Twilight for a non-sleep potion thingy, which initially makes Twilight hesitant to give it to her because she doesn't know what kind of side effects it may cause, but she eventually caves in. However, that potion works too well and leaves Applejack not able to fall asleep ever. The long and short of it is that Applejack ends up overworking herself and goes crazy and kills a bunch of ponies around town, since she blames all her problems on Filthy Rich, and she hallucinates every pony she sees as him. Skipping ahead to the end, so we don't have to be here all day, Applejack wakes up in a prison cell where she gets a visit from Twilight. Since it was technically Twilight's fault for giving Applejack a potion that had unknown side effects that resulted in the massacre of at least a dozen innocent ponies, she decided to bury this little incident by trying to gaslight Applejack into thinking that there was no potion in the first place, but instead she just overworked herself in the heat to the point of killing others. The story ends with Twilight revealing that they replaced Applejack with Starlight as the element of honesty, and Applejack is going to live the rest of her life in this dungeon, rotting away. First and foremost, I cannot take the ending seriously since this was how the very last line was phrased. I get why, and I think that it's the best it's going to get, but still. Other than that, this one was competently written. It didn't really rely heavily on gore or shock value like some other ones we talked about. Unlike Cupcakes, where Pinky is just acting out of character for no reason other than to make a shock fic, this story actually smartly subverts that whole ordeal by making Applejack drink a potion that results in her acting out of character. Furthermore, even that is stemmed from the motivation of wanting to save her farm, which makes logical sense, and all that concludes with us having a story that doesn't seem like another case of inserting well-known characters into dark situations as a lazy way to make a story happen. There are a couple questions you could ask that'll probably kinda destroy the story's plot, such as how Filthy Rich isn't really an evil, greedy businessman in the show, but he is in this story, which is different, I guess. Also, why is there a heat stroke in the story if the weather is controlled by the ponies themselves in this universe? Not only that, surely Princess Celestia could probably chill it with the sun a bit somehow, since that's her job, sorta. But still, as what it is, I suppose it's fine. 
I mean, because this was written post-2015, I don't think this story is really remembered to be up there with the classics. However, the reading by the lost narrator does the story tons of justice, so I think that people who do know about it do regard it as one of My Little Pony creepypastas that are actually competently written. As some form of cosmic coincidence, it seems like a new official sequel series called Another Apple Experiment just started being written and narrated like a few days ago from writing this. And from what's out so far, it seems fun. Moving on. Wow, let's see if Worst Pony also has Worst Story. There's not much to summarize for this one since it's written in the format of a forensic report rather than an actual story, but basically we're told that there was a live My Little Pony meet and greet show with people in mascot costumes. However, the Fluttershy costume smelled bad and had blacked out eyes. Also noted was how the individual in the costume, a woman named Katherine Wilson, was intoxicated and acting grabby with the kids. When the person organizing the event tried getting Katherine to stop, a bunch of black goo started oozing out of the costume. Then it turns out that she wasn't actually in the costume but was rather in a mop room who was quote naked and bleeding from her right hand four of her fingernails missing from scratching her hand across the wall wow i'm glad to know that even in a terrifying situation like this the person relaying this information was able to count and tell that precisely four of her fingernails were missing it's also said that quote in her own blood she had written as follows there are too many fluttershies they won't let me breath there are too many fluttershies they won't let me think the fluttershies hate me the fluttershies hate me the fluttershies are laughing at me Okay, sure. If I was in that situation, I'd likely be scared beyond belief. But the fact that this woman used the wrong there twice and used an apostrophe when she was trying to talk about plurals and said breath instead of breathe, all of this would probably just get me more dumbfounded than anything. Anyways, the conclusion from this report is literally just, we agree that Miss Catherine Wilson had taken some illegal drug and was intoxicated. Furthermore, Catherine gets hospitalized, but then eventually goes missing. The story ends with this addendum. It is unknown at this time who is responsible for inflating all of those yellow balloons with the pink butterflies and rabbit designs in the room of Miss Wilson, nor is it clear who left a Fluttershy doll with its eyes blacked out in her room as well. We will have to conduct an internal investigation into who might be responsible for such actions and speak with our manufacturers in China. These dolls aren't supposed to be on the market yet and the fact that one of them showed up in a mental hospital is clearly a violation of our marketing and product policies. When found, the employee or employees should be terminated immediately to prevent further violations. Implying that obviously there are forces beyond the control of humans that's going on in the background, which is a nice way to leave the story on a dun 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 note, I suppose. I like how I started talking about every story starting with the positive so far. I'll actually start with the negatives this time because I've got a whole lot less negative things to say about this one. The only thing I really caught on to was how there were some typos like I mentioned along with how the person or people writing the report see something that's obviously not normal but they're super skeptical to the point of trying to think of a non-paranormal answer but uh, I guess that's the more realistic approach. And uh, that's literally it. I actually really enjoyed this story. Because this one takes place in reality rather than being based on the show's universe, it felt more like an an actual horror story that put a creepy twist on My Little Pony as a franchise, rather than writing the characters to be murderers or whatever. That left a lot less room for error, such as characters being out of character or accidentally neglecting in-show world building. Plus, because the story takes place a few weeks before the show even aired, it really makes you wonder why there are evil forces targeting this show and Fluttershy in specific. I think the atmosphere of the story is actually spooky, and the fact that it has all these cool concepts is really effective in making you wonder what the rest of this world is like. And if there were and if there are going to be other similar situations in the future in this universe and how far all this extends to. Though the good thing is that we don't have to wonder since the author wrote other stuff in this series. And while I can't exactly say that I've read all of these yet, I probably will eventually because if Fluttershmooze was anything to go by, the rest of these have to be pretty good. But for now, let's just move on to the next one. <sighs> Oof, I was dreading this one. <laughs> You know, it seems like nobody really felt like writing creepypastas about rarity since Lil Miss Rarity might as well be the only rarity creepypasta in existence. Unless if you want to counter the video Rarity's new patterns, but I think that's stretching the term creepypasta to its absolute limits at that point. Anyways, there might be other rarity creepypastas, but Lil Miss Rarity is pretty much the only one anyone ever talks about. But then I looked closer and Lil Miss Rarity ain't a single creepypasta, but it's a Tumblr blog run by someone named Lil Miss J or Love Tonic. Anyways, I thought, sure, it might be slightly hard to find and read all of them and tell it like a narrative like I've been doing with the other ones so far, but I guess I gotta do what I gotta. I was wondering why there's like no videos on YouTube going in depth about what this story contains, but after reading through it, I can definitely see why. 
The very first post from the blog is Rarity talking to the camera about how she got this big scratch from her stupid cat opalescence, but she actually ended up enjoying it. What's kinda notable is how right from the get-go, Rarity makes mention of Pink Amina and her Tumblr blog. We'll get back to this whole Pink Amina thing later on, but for now, I just want to note that Rarity saying that she likes her blog immediately sorta of destroys any sense of immersion that this story could have built up for itself. We go on to find out that Rarity ended up killing opalescence and putting her heart in this Pink Amina doll that's also partly made of her skin. Anyways, we get a bunch of posts basically just building up how Rarity is a degenerate addicted to self-inflicted pain, such as shoving a knife up her rear as a means of deriving enjoyment. That's kind of disgusting. Also, she gets this logo thing burned into herself. It doesn't stop there since she also tries involving her own little sister, Sweetie Belle, and her friend Twist in these shenanigans. Also, she knocks Twilight out via a sewing machine, and that causes her to get arrested eventually or, or something. The way Rarity escapes this conundrum is uh, that weird pink Amina doll bursts out of her chest since having open people's heart inside it gave it life. And uh, I gotta be honest, this is where the story kind of just goes way off the rails. Try to bear with me here as I quickly summarize a bit of what happens next. One of Rarity's eyes go black and Pink Amina kills her, but she doesn't die for some reason. Later, Rarity wakes up from her dream and everything is normal, including how Pink Amina is still normal Pinky. However, Rarity chooses to not be normal, but instead decides to kidnap Applejack, Pinkie Pie, and Rainbow Dash to make her perfect world. Which is kind of stupid because earlier she showed regrets of being super perverted. Anyways, Rarity gives birth to this weird evil creature, Abaddon, who is about to wreak havoc. Then Twilight finds this book that talks about how to get rid of all this evil stuff, which involves sacrificing her teeth. So she summons this goat guy named Malice, who is Abaddon's illegitimate father, who appears to be hosting a game show. Then he makes a deal with Twilight, stops Abaddon, and proceeds to go inside her to direct her to cut Rarity's horn off. Now, if you're confused, that is as concise as it's going to get. Malice going inside Twilight marks the end of the 99th entry for Little Miss Rarity, and it was followed up by this video that's pretty much a recap of the things I summarized so far. I'm not gonna play the whole thing, the rest of it is literally just what I summarized so far. Except for the whole Abaddon and Malice plot for some reason. And I think that this is a reasonable place to leave off the story for now. Once again, starting off with the positives, the vibe of this world is terrifying. The fact that there's no color present in it besides this ominous maroon background and red blood is actually very effective in making the story feel scary and claustrophobic. It just doesn't sit right with me subconsciously. It always feels like there's danger looming imminent. Usually because there is, but aside from literal danger, the body shapes of these ponies are creepy since they're not quite pony and not quite human. It triggers the uncanny valley part of my brain. Plus, the fact that the only characters we really see or weird corrupted versions of the main six, plus some guards and creatures, I guess, makes this universe super claustrophobic, which once again is also aided by how the visuals are pretty much composed of this one color. In terms of creating horror and an uncomfortable atmosphere, all of this is very effective. So I will say that this story excels at atmosphere, or at least until they switch up the art style to clean outlines later on, which kind of ruins everything I just complimented with so far. But how about the actual plot? Well, the entire story read like the author making things up as he went along, especially with Abaddon and Matt. Alice. Little Miss Rarity begins grounded in the simple fundamental premise of Rarity being a disturbed individual, but it eventually introduces concepts like her plush coming to life because the heart of a cat is in it, or revival, or how there's a magical camera following Rarity around, etc. Maybe the author just got bored of having a simple concept at first and decided to change it up. Still, even if the story was all over the place, at least all of that kept me wondering about what'll happen next and it kept me engaged. Am I going to read this thing ever again? Probably not, but at least it was a better read than Cupcakes. It's so weird. When you look up My Little Pony Creepypasta on Google Images, we get a bunch of art featuring Little Miss Rarity, but there doesn't really seem to be much discussion of it anywhere. The most viewed thing related to the story is that recap animation thing, which actually doesn't even make any sense to the viewer if you have no idea what the story is about, and I somehow doubt that almost 9 million people have actually read it. I think a source that many people get information about Little Miss Rarity from is this page on the Villains Wiki, which is stupid since it's so erroneous that it's not even funny. She doesn't have any changes from her mainstream counterpart, but she later has scratch marks on her face. Oh really? I didn't know the mainstream counterpart Rarity also stood on her hind legs and had a black eye and had a heart-shaped burn on her chest? Also, what do you mean she later has scratch marks on her face? The very first entry of the blog literally features Rarity talking about how she got those scratches. I didn't know you could have this many things wrong with a single sentence. Not to mention how if you go down to the trivia section, there is one item that ends with, according to Mr. Creepypasta's amino post about Little Miss Rarity. Was the person who wrote this too lazy to verify this themselves? You would hope that because this wiki 
is full of wrong information, there would be a separate wiki just dedicated to Little Miss Rarity so we can get more dedicated and accurate information, right? What is this? A Little Miss Rarity wiki? Wow, that is very readable. But whatever, let's see what kind of cool information is on the page for Rarity. Anyways, like I said, the very first entry of this series involves Rarity talking about Pink Amina, which is actually a reference to this now defunct Ask Pink Amina Tumblr blog, which I'm assuming is the actual origin point of people associating that name with Cupcake's Pinky, you know, despite it being spelt wrong. I think the mention of Pink Amina in this story was a way to get a quick jumpstart in an audience by Lil Miss J by trying to force itself into Pink Amina lore. Looking through some behind the scenes videos he made, he actually expressed some regret doing this, which I assume is because he realized he wanted to make Lil Miss Rarity stand and as its own entity without relying on other blogs. I chose not to mention Pink Amina Dian Pie in any points of the uh, the update because I'm trying to wean away from that. Um, that's their thing. It's not my thing. I shouldn't be using them for popularity. I already did. As for the future of this story, this Tumblr post from just last year basically tells us what's going on. Over the last nine months, I've dealt with personal health issues, some mental and some rheumatoid arthritis, and most financial. The issues haven't been resolved to their fullest, but most have, especially my health issues. My mental health had a very severe decline when I realized that the Brony fandom had quite a lot of gatekeeping, toxic people, people jumping to horrible conclusions, etc. in it. I took a long hard look at the Brony fandom and left. Lil Miss Rarity is one of the two, the other being my OCs, things that'll keep me making pony content, however. While I'm rebranding back into a furry artist and no longer associating with bronies after 11 years of being horribly mistreated by people in the fandom, I am also planning to continue updating Lil Miss Rarity for many years on end. This basically means that this 12 year old story is still going, though once again, this update was from last year and it's also the second last thing ever posted on the blog altogether, so I'm not sure if we'll ever even see how the story concludes in our lifetimes. That's a big Big reason I left this off at like entry number 100, since that means I technically read about 3 years worth of content of a series that's still not concluded. Let us try to live slowly for a little. The actual very last thing posted on the blog is a video on how the author, Little Miss J, is attempting to flee his hometown because it sucks there, and how he had a tough life growing up. It's an extremely personal video full of Little Miss J lore, so to speak, and it gives insight into the psychology of the type of person that would make Little Miss rarity, I guess. <laughs> if I listed everything, it would just go completely insane. And if I told how horrible of a person my dad was, I could be here for like 17 more hours. Like, he, he literally threatened to stab us with an ice pick in our sleep because we bought pizza with olives on it. Not to say, this guy is so messed up, ha ha ha, no wonder why he would make something messed up like Little Miss Rarity, but more... Yeah, I can see where the messed upness of Lil Miss Rarity is stemming from, no judgment whatsoever. For what it's worth, Lil Miss J, if you happen to be watching this, I genuinely hope that you'll get better and I will be praying for you and your family's safety. Now something tells me you're not exactly Mr. Religious by any stretch of the imagination, and I'm sure I'll get a couple comments on this video saying, you believe in God, lol, loser, but like, let me just be nice for once. Alright then, I wonder who the last one will be. <laughs> Anything but Twilight, anything but Twilight, anything but... <laughs> For some inexplicable reason, this one was harder to find than all the other ones so far. As in, generally with these stories, you just look them up and you're ready to go with the official upload of the story. However, for this one, apparently it was considered lost media at some point in time. In fact, the place I read it from was on the Worst Pastas wiki. I'm pretty sure that the actual official original upload of it is long gone, so I really have no idea who wrote it. According to the wiki, it was apparently written by some guy named Smaziv, but the only thing I could find out about anyone going by that name online were these two YouTube channels that I have no idea if they're actually even related to anything. But either way, just knowing that the original upload of this story was gone and one of the only evidences of this story even existing is on something called the Worst Pasta wiki. I knew I shouldn't be expecting much from this at all. Let us just get into it. So, we start off with the information that it is the first anniversary of Twilight coming over to Ponyville. Apparently, this was so important to stress that the author lets us know twice. Instead of making redundant statements, I wish the author would have spent the time to space out all these dialogues as their own lines and fix the abundant nature of all these typos. One of the other ponies questioned, why didn't the author just bother to name a random one? Why did he have to say one of the other? Anyways, Twilight tells the main six to follow her into this downstairs section in her treehouse because she wants to put on some experiments to know more more about friendship. Surprise, surprise, she tortures them one by one, slowly taking their lives away. I'm not even gonna bother going into detail with the methods she used, but I will say that some of them were not creative, but 
innovative, maybe. Also, it was dumb how it's revealed that Apple Bloom has been dead for a while out of nowhere in chapter three. This should have been mentioned in chapter one to set things up. Why would Applejack go to a party if her sister has been missing? Not only that, but it turns out that Twilight had done similar experiments on Lyra, Soren, Snails, Mayor Mare, and Zakora. Why has literally nobody questioned or investigated how not only these two children disappeared, but also the literal mayor of Ponyville going missing? How am I supposed to read this like an actual story when you've literally got a line that says, Author's note, I do not have a fetish for someone kissing vulvas with blood dripping down both lips. I just wanted to show Twilight's sick state of mind. Yeah, I didn't think so. Almost as if there's this concept called fiction where characters do things. Did we really have to disrupt the little amount of flow this had just to make that profound statement? Uh, let's move on. I swear I generally have journalistic integrity, but I, I literally didn't even finish this one because of how dragging it was. After reading the fifth chapter and realizing that I've just about had enough, I just skimmed through the remaining stuff. Also, I decided to watch this group of fellas review the story to get the gist of the rest. Hello and welcome to Fanatic Fiction. I am the I me. I am the Joker. Yeah. Then I realized that that was also stupid because it becomes pretty clear that the host of this podcast or whatever didn't even bother paying attention to the story himself either. So, here, this story, I, I, I love it for a lot of reasons, but the main, the main premise of the story is... Twilight invites her friends over, knocks them out, a la cupcakes, and then proceeds to torture and kill them throughout hold on, the story. Hold on, does not knock them out, actually. Leads them downstairs, says- She okay. leads them downstairs. Like, hearing the host guy do his Joker impression trying to stay in character, even though he's being roasted for getting so much information wrong on his own podcast, might actually be one of the most unintentionally funniest things I've ever seen. I think she shreds her own vocal cords. She screams so loud that her vocal cords like are Snap. well no the, the the she like literally uh coughs them up and spits them across the room yeah 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 i'm pretty sure that's a detail like. and then finally she yeah with it, 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 it since she can't scream anymore she starts like thrashing around she thrashes so hard she snaps her own neck and kills her well, she, yeah she's thrashing because of the electric current the, the last thing twilight does is, is like puts this electric electrical current through her body I think they do, and Twilight wins, and she straps her back down, and then Twilight saws off Rarity's horn. Oh god, no, it was a lot earlier, because she tries to That was save, way earlier. She tries yeah. to save Pinkie Pie, I swear, she, she tries to save Pinkie Pie, and that's when- I swear it's before Pinkie dies. dies. No, I don't think- I don't think it's before Pinkie dies. Yeah, yeah, I'll it's rock it up, hold thing. on. One of the very first things she saws off Rarity's horn. Man, it's, yeah. be it's before she tortures Pinkie. Okay, okay. And, wait, no, Rar Rarity gets a knife with her magic and slices at Twilight with it. No, no, that was Fluttershy. That was Fluttershy. Throws it at her. I thought that was, I thought, I thought Rarity did that too. It's Fluttershy. Uh, but just to prove that I didn't not finish this story just because of the length, I have to bring up how bad the actual grammar and spelling was. Such as this line, out of uh, that? What does that even mean? Not to mention how the author ran out of ways to say said, so he wrote this line like you would write a script. Also, how can you write, the insane pony just kept biting off and munching on her helpings of Pinkie Pie like she was eating a chicken leg. And expect me, as a reader, to take the story seriously instead of laughing. In terms of the actual story, it was stupid because the big scare comes from the fact that Twilight is sane during all her experiments and she's completely aware of what she's doing. But then it goes on to mention how her eyes are glowing red. That is stupid. Pick a side. Not to mention how because Twilight lures five ponies to torture one at a time, you have the ponies that aren't being tortured just sitting there doing nothing. This is an incredibly easy problem to fix. Just put the ponies into separate rooms and you won't have to focus on all of them at the same time. The main show also had this exact same problem in a few episodes since it is incredibly hard to balance six characters together and give them all a satisfying conclusion in one story. But whereas the actual show limits itself to 22 minutes at a time and knows to wrap up a story regardless if it's satisfying or not, this story is like five or six 22 minutes and just keeps going because there's nothing telling it to shut up for a second. Overall, it's safe to say that the experiments of Twilight Sparkle comes from an author just trying to be edgy rather than from a need to tell a story. Unlike how Rainbow Factory and Fluttershmooze had more unique concepts that had an idea of an original world they wanted to bring to life, this story doesn't even take place in an alternate grimy version of Questria, so there's not much going for it here. I might as well just put on an actual episode of the show and imagine the characters getting tortured in my head instead, because that's literally what this story is. Like I said, because we don't really know who wrote this magnificent story, it's kind 
kind of impossible to find out what other glorious and not boring works this author has under his belt. I'm actually shocked that the top 10 My Little Pony Creepypastas video I brought up earlier dared to feature this story in it. It's almost as if the guy who made that video didn't even bother reading anything on it. He starts the video off by saying this. We're looking at the fanfics that are dark enough to send shivers down your spine. We're also putting in consideration how big they are in the fandom and not focusing on stories that just thrive on blood and killing characters. Yet he puts this story on it, and I don't actually see too many people even acknowledging this story's existence, but maybe it was actually popular at some point? I'm just at a loss for words. Though, on the contrary, someone who isn't at a loss for words seems to be this deviant art user who wrote a review of the story. The idea of Twilight trying to break each one of her friends in order to understand their limits in regards to the elements they represent does not sound as a bad idea at all, but it certainly didn't work to out here and the author dropped several good opportunities for the plot. Like, if Rainbow Dash is the element of loyalty, why not testing her loyalty in a way like, Dash, you name one of the other ponies in this room and I kill her instead of you. I could type a lot more of this examples, but I won't. You know, even though the grammar in this review is worse than the one in the actual story, it was still way easier to follow along with, and I agree completely with the statement. A decent idea, but a less than ideal execution. What a thought to leave this on. So, there we have it. Six slightly classic-ish pony pastas. Now, do I think that any of these were literary masterpieces that'll be academically studied throughout the ends of the earth? No, not exactly. However, I think that the reason there's so many of these and why there's so much fan art of them is because, like, we're juxtaposing this cutesy wootsy thing with some of, like, the darkest things that the human might could even conjure up. Whether it's for the sake of being edgy or just to introduce more, like, favorable genres we'll never get to see in the actual show, I definitely get the appeal. Even if the stories themselves aren't too good, I really like the idea of putting these cute, happy things through scary death stuff just to see what the result would be. And yes, I know that I was, like, kind of harsh for some of these stories, but I really appreciate all of these for existing. But you know what? This is just the beginning. If you guys enjoyed this video, I might make another part to this whole thing, so make sure to leave comments suggesting what I should talk about next. And no, they don't necessarily have to be based on the main six. I just used this format for the video just as a starting point. Also, as per tradition on my channel, here is my sincerest apologies for taking so long between uploads. I'm sorry. But you know, it's kind of hard to feel motivated when like quite a few of my videos were being copyright claimed by Hasbro, even though they're 100% within fair use. Breaking the law to steal some of your supporters' hard-earned money. That's very nice of you, Hasbro. Very classy. Perhaps expect re-uploads of these videos re-edited with less like show footage soon because uh... This really ain't it. But what is it is you guys. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you watch it to the end, I know this was like the longest video on my channel. And uh, guess what? There's videos that's even longer that I'm working on. So stay tuned for that. And uh, thank you guys for watching. Until next time, this has been F-Minus signing out.